Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel podcast, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we speak with Ross Smith, principal at WJE, or known as Wiss Janney and Elsner Associates. Ross is going to provide us with steps that can be taken to reduce the likelihood of structural failures. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardle. I'm a licensed engineer at DCI Engineers, practicing on structural projects in California with an undergraduate degree from Cal Poly Pomona and a master's degree in structural engineering from UC San Diego. And I'm your co-host, Alexis Clark. I work in Hilti's North America headquarters as the product manager of our chemical anchoring portfolio in the US and Canada. I'm a licensed professional engineer in Texas. I received my bachelor's in civil engineering from UT Austin and I'm currently pursuing an MBA at Auburn. So really quickly before we dive into this episode, I wanna share with you a special announcement. This week is Groundwater Awareness Week. For many of us, however, groundwater does not really seem like an important issue. That is why Groundwater Awareness Week exists to change that opinion. Groundwater takes up 99% of Earth's usable water, accounting for much of U.S. municipalities, drinking supply, and agricultural irrigation. As the world's most extracted raw material, many homes and businesses rely on groundwater for everyday use. Groundwater Awareness Week, founded by the National Groundwater Association, aims to raise awareness of the importance of groundwater. If you're looking for a great way to learn about groundwater, check out the resources that the National Groundwater Association has to offer and learn about how groundwater works. Take the time to attend an informative seminar about groundwater at your local university. Read up on statistics that organizations have funded and see what the current issues are when it comes to groundwater or check on your home water well with an inspector to see what the quality of your groundwater is and how you can help protect your water supply. And now I'd like to introduce our guest for this episode, Ross Smith. Ross Smith has over 20 years of experience as a structural and building enclosure consulting engineer with additional specialties in unique failure assessments and building enclosure commissioning. He was named the 2020 Engineer of the Year by the Western Chapter of the Michigan Society of Professional Engineers. Ross operates out of the greater Grand Rapids area where he lives with his family and serves clients throughout Michigan, Indiana, and most of the Midwest with a focus on the West Michigan Lakeshore area. His experience includes catastrophic failure investigations, structural investigations, assessment, repair, rehabilitation, and design. Also facade inspections, building closure, slash envelope commissioning, building condition assessments, litigation, technical support, and more. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week. Ross, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you. We briefly introduced you just now to our guests and kind of shared a little bit about your experiences. But in your own words, would you mind kind of sharing with us a little bit about what it is that you do on a daily basis? It sounds like you have a really wide variety, a uh, really fantastic variety of skills. You've touched on it. Um, on a daily basis, that's hard. it's hard to answer that because my days are all different. It's kind of tricky. Um, and that's one of the things I like about my job is I rarely do the same things twice. Um, one day looks a lot different than the next. So as an investigative engineer, because it's so unpredictable, one day I might be uh, looking at a collapse because of snow or, or maybe fire damage. And the next day I'm in meetings for a project that I've been working on for six years where we're replacing all the windows in a hospital. So it, if you really break it down, though, if you break down all the components of all the different projects I do, I, I really like to make it, I, I like to think of it as I'm helping people solve their problems. And, and that science seems like a simplification, but that's two really good things. I'm helping people and I'm solving problems. I like doing both of those things and that's w- what I get to do every day. So maybe not a traditional answer, but it's a, it's a good job, a great job. And uh, the variety really keeps it interesting. No, I think that's fantastic. I think we, we do have um, quite a few young listeners who are still in school and who may not have the full breadth of design experience or field work that they would like to. And I think a lot of young uh, aspiring engineers maybe think that all we do is sit at a desk every day. And it's nice to know that daily activities change every single day, or they can in, in many different versions of both civil and structural engineering. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I sit at my desk a lot, but uh, probably only about 50% of the time. And that's one of the reasons I like consulting, engineering, and, and investigations, because 
it gets me in the field that lets me do different things. Yeah. Very cool. I know, I know with engineering, I think that's I'm, what we all like to do. I think it's like you were saying, problem solving. And for me, that's, I don't know. I feel like I'm solving puzzles all day. So it's like always something that one of the things that I find fulfilling uh, Ross in reference to an article that you wrote in the structure magazine entitled falling through the cracks uh, that focuses on steps that can be taken to reduce uh, structural failures. Can you uh, tell us what those typical steps are that the structural engineers follow during a design process? Yeah, so I'm happy to share those. I think it's important to understand, first of all, these steps aren't perfect. Uh, it's not going to capture all the nuances of the design process. And I don't need, I don't need emails or texts or something. People, hey, you missed this piece of it. The, the point of this is to kind of outline a general consensus of these are the steps we look typically go through as engineers. And, and the point of it, um, hence the title, Falling Through the Cracks, is there are gaps. There are areas there that we don't have control over. And that kind of sets the framework for the article and, and for this discussion. So understanding those caveats, the general design procedure steps that I've identified for us to, to consider our, our first, we gather the av available information about the project. After we have all that, we establish assumptions. Next, we apply the codes and the loading scenarios based on that information and those assumptions. And then we get into selecting the actual materials, the member sizes and all, of, all the nitty gritty that we engineers like to do. That kind of completes the, the construction document portion of things. And then we go into reviewing shop drawings, and finally, hopefully the budget allows for periodic field inspections as things get erected. So those six steps, again, they're more of a general framework and they're, they're a guide for our discussion and was a big part of that article that you mentioned, Matt. Yeah, when I was reading it, I think you made a good point about it is typical. Like there's def definitely special projects that sometimes you may not have too much control, but yeah, definitely making the point that it is typical guidelines. And like you were saying, it's every project's going to be different, but in general, that's what it's going to go through. I want to make one really quick distinction and just make sure that we're on the same page because I work with a lot of high school students and um, especially in, in young um, like engineering magnet classes that they have nowadays, they keep trying to reiterate uh, this concept of the iterative design process. So while you just laid out the steps, that process doesn't necessarily happen once for a project. And oftentimes we're doing this in a cyclical nature. It's like, just like the scientific method. There's an evaluation stage at the end. And then we have to go back and, and tinker with things as we need to, right? Yeah, that's an important thing to say, Alexis, because um, in an ideal world, in a, in a traditional AE environment, we, we would say, okay, well, the, the architectural lead brings you, here's the, here's the footprint of the building. Here's what I want it to look like, go. And that never happens, right? It's, well, I want it to feel this way. And I want a cantilever that's 35 feet long. Like, well, that's probably not very realistic with the section sizes we have. So there's definitely a, a team aspect and iterative process. So I'd say that available information and the assumptions, uh, that kind of is cemented early, but then applying load and coding and then selecting materials and member sizes, that can be very iterative. And, and maybe sometimes your assumptions as a structural engineer are vastly different than what a more imaginative architect may have thought. And, and you have to work through that. So it's certainly not just a checklist and you're done and um, you move on. There's there's definitely iterations there. So that's, oh, that's, that's a big distinction to make. That situation with the architect has never happened before. No, that was totally <laughs> hypothetical. <laughs> It's fantastic. I like it. Um, so one of the things I really like that you mentioned early in the article, right after you've kind of walked us through what the standard design process looks like, is that when we take a hard look in the mirror, I think you call it an honest assessment, which I really like. It's good to be a little self-reflective. Um, there are a lot of other factors outside of this design process that really can impact the job site and the project that the engineer can't necessarily predict um, and, and control if we do have, have knowledge of it. What are some of those different factors that structural engineering professionals um, either have to rely on or should consider? That's a long list. And we could, we could talk about that for hours, but I think, I think you touched on it with the self-reflective, the honest assessment. Uh, we as engineers, we often like to think that we're in control of everything and we, and we try to do that. But the reality is, and that's the title of the article, right? Is things can fall through the cracks. 
So let me give you a few examples as you kind of flow through that process. So, so first, you might get some, we'll call it imperfect information about the site itself, um, how the building's gonna be positioned on the site, what that soil capacity is, maybe what the water table level is, all things that are kind of provided to you from the soils report or from some environmental reports, they might not be perfectly accurate. You may not be able to, to verify them either, but understand you're relying on information provided by others that, that might not be perfect. Um, going on from there, as you're specifying materials or you're designing things, you start looking at material information or communications that the, the manufacturer might've put out or you're looking for material testing data that you know this steel can do this or this flashing can handle this situation. Sometimes those aren't accurate, but sometimes the data doesn't really correspond to what you're trying to specify. And it's just, again, you're relying on something else that you don't have a great understanding of. You're, you're expecting that they provided perfect information. Then there's, then there's procurement, you know, getting, getting material. Uh, let's say you specify a certain type of steel, not understanding that that steel is much more expensive this year because of international business relations or something, or, or the lead time is going to add 12 to 30 weeks to the project. It, you didn't know that. You're just specifying material. So those things can be a problem. And then you can get into what's the fabricator doing? Um, how, how good is the guy or the, or the gal that is welding? Is that the 30-year veteran that is the best one in the shop? Or are you getting the person that just finished their certifications the week before? Like how, how good of a material are we actually getting? And you can look at the masons and the steel erectors. Are they actually doing what the plans say? I can't tell you how many times I've been to a site and I'll, I'll kind of drill down into a specific detail that I want to discuss. I'm like, oh, I'm not sure this is quite right. Hey, let's, let's look at what I, what I had specified or what the other engineer had specified and let's make sure we're, we're getting this. And they'll, and they'll say something like, I've never seen this or I've never seen these drawings or this detail. And like, what, what do you mean? I'm just doing this the way my boss told me to do it. I, I, this is how I always do it. I don't know anything about that detail you're talking about. So when you, when you hear things like that as an engineer, it makes you pull your hair out a little, a little bit because of the, the hours that you put into it and you, you're like, this is important. Um, not just because it's the way you wanted it, but because it's the way it needs to be for safety and that sort of thing. So if we sum all those examples up, you know, bad information up front, less than perfect technical information coming in, and then maybe some suspect installers, the reality is every critical aspect of the project, of the process, has areas of gray that we as engineers think we have our hands around, and we often have a good influence on, but we don't, it doesn't always happen that way. So we, we need to be discerning as professionals and and the term I like to use that I stole from a colleague of mine is be respectfully skeptical about things. Not, not question everything, not be too pessimistic, but ask those questions and, and make sure everyone understands what your intent was and that you understand all of the data that's coming in as well as you can. I love that. I think I've often heard the term um, a healthy curiosity, just to kind of- That's probably better. It's probably, <laughs> probably a little cleaner. <laughs> tomato, tomato. I do have one quick question about something you just mentioned. So one of the things you, you brought up was the availability of materials and that having a huge impact on project schedules. Um, I know that there's been a lot of fluctuation over the past year with the pandemic, global supply chains, material sourcing has been a total mess. From your perspective, I, I understand you work with a lot of different building materials. Um, have you noticed that there's been an exacerbation of that issue in the projects you've worked on over the past year? And do you think that's gonna continue moving forward? I'm certainly not an expert in procurement like that. So, so take that with a grain of salt, but I do see, uh, I saw this year through COVID demand, demand was outpacing what, what they could supply it with um, from a lumber standpoint, from, from windows. Um, we actually did a, a renovation in our house. So a, a much smaller scale project and part of it was our kitchen. And they're like, yeah, they just laughed. They're like, yeah, your appliances aren't coming like for weeks, weeks more than we expected. So th that was just a, a small example, but there's, there's such a weird supply and demand discrepancy across the board on different things. So I can't give you a great, like it's just steel or it's just concrete materials. I, I do know lumber prices went up a lot in the last year, but I do think 
as the world markets continue to kind of struggle with whatever COVID's going to throw at us next, uh, I think that is a consideration that we need to understand, especially as we get back to work and con construction sites are kind of getting back to the new normal um, with safety protocols and that sort of stuff in place. It doesn't mean that doesn't make the truck get there any faster or the, the ship get there any faster. So I do think that will continue to be disruptive. And while that's not really the engineer's problem, um, you know, it, it, if you separate yourself from the, the overall project, you say, look, this is the material we need it to be. But at the same time, if, if that material is completely unavailable or the, the lead times are completely unreasonable, you might need to go through another iteration, as you mentioned, and, and change the design pretty drastically. So it's something, uh, especially as a young engineer, you might need to be aware of, you know, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm ready to go. This is a reinforced concrete structure and something happens and suddenly it needs to be steel or vice versa. Uh, that that could change things and, and make for a few unexpected late nights as you re, redo some work. So I don't know the answers to that, but I do think it's something we need to continue to keep in mind. Ross, I wanted to jump into uh, one of the, the the cool projects that I saw in the article. It was the the Sounds of Silence project. Could you go into that and kind of kind of what the lessons learned on on that one was and just a quick summary of it? Yeah, I'm not great at quick, right? I'm kind of wordy, so I'll, uh, I'll try to keep it short. But this was a church uh, in northern Michigan, and they it's uh, an iconic structure in the in the community there and a big bell tower on it. And people used to gather around the bell tower and listen to concerts. And it's not just bells, it's actually a carillon, which is like an organ, but it's a bunch of bells. So people, you know, just imagine, you know, s small port town, in the summer, people gathering around it. And it was just kind of this community thing that they did a lot. Well, the, the building's from the 1880s. So it's getting old and some masonry problems were occurring and and a few uh, bricks had shaled off and hit the ground. And it, it caused the, the the leaders of the of the church to begin to believe there was some significant problems such that they, they shuttered the whole program. They stopped using the carillon. Um, so the concerts were were canceled and they were getting ready to demolish the entire structure. Uh, someone on the board or some um, concerned parishioner said, hey, I think we should get somebody else involved just to get another opinion. And that's that's where we came in. And we took a look at it and started to understand what their concerns were. And they, they were saying, look, these bells, they're whipping around and they're causing all these vibrations in the tower and they're making it fall apart. And I said, wow, that's really interesting. You know, we can do a vibrational analysis. We can do all this, but let me just take a, take a look at the building. And so I got to climb up into the tower and I, I like doing that kind of stuff again, better than sitting at the desk all day. So we're climbing ladders and stairs. And one of the first things as I'm asking, hey, can we go up here? And they're like, what do you mean? You want to go up there? <laughs> yeah, I want to go up there. Well, no one goes up there. Can I go up there? Well, well, no one's been up there in years. <laughs> like I, I need to see the structure that we're talking about. So I go up there and I get I'm amongst these bells and they're bigger than I am. They're really cool. The first thing I notice is the bells, they don't swing. They're totally fixed in place. They have an electronic activator actuator that hits the side of it. So I'm like immediately, okay, the dynamic motions of these bells flinging around, that that's not a thing. That's not actually happening. So one check mark of of concern kind of gone. The other is uh, I quickly realized that the bell structure, all the carillon, the whole carillon is supported by an independent timber structure inside of the outer masonry structure. So all the load bearing characteristics of that outer masonry um, are important, but they are not interfacing with that inner timber structure. So if we think about that, it's really cool. Someone thought through that in the 1880s and said, we need to isolate these things. And then somehow they built that, a structure within a structure. So really cool. Uh, they did a great job 140 years ago. But what that means now is it, whatever vibrations are coming from those bells, even though they're not so dynamic, but there, there could still be some vibrations. They're not being transmitted to that outer masonry. So now blaming the carillon is just not okay and we don't need to shut that thing down and looking at it further there was some differential movement that we would expect between perpendicular pieces and there was a lot of masonry deterioration that i would expect in a building of 140 years of age 
but it needed it needed some tender loving care it needed some masonry restoration but it did not need to be torn down and uh, in the end they they understood once we kind of showed them a few more things they understood okay we don't need to do this they began a maintenance program and a repair program and they started using the carillon again and the and there's actually video footage on youtube of like the first concert back so it was a beautiful building that got saved just because um we got them some a little bit better information so so the lesson learned so we can't we got to again be respectfully skeptical what did you call it alexis what was your better word for it uh have a healthy curiosity yeah healthy <laughs> curiosity of so why do we think we need to tear this down and and again not be critical they're not structural engineers but but dive deeper into those early assumptions because they were driving a lot of really big decisions and and peel that apart and say i get where you're going i share your concern about the masonry but this isn't going the way that you think it is and uh, a really good outcome on that one so again that, that i'm not blaming the structural designer obviously that person is is long no longer with us from 140 years ago but um challenging assumptions wherever they come from is a really important thing to do uh, and that's so neat too that you got to kind of uncover this this history of the design of the structure and that the the engineer in 1880 had the wherewithal to separate that timber structure from the masonry structure and actually give the building a, a fighting chance to last 140 years until it needed some serious work. Yeah, yeah it just, was cool. Yeah. It was really cool. What you were talking about was the assumptions and that was a big assumption. I mean, it sounds good when you think of it like, yeah, I could see that the, the bells would be causing vibration, etc. And I think everyone thought that, but as the structural engineer, if you didn't ask that question, if you didn't insist, to you know just let's just double check what's going on here that's yeah like you were saying that was a big change in their process and it probably saved them a lot of money and 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 headache if they went that route of completely demol demolishing everything a lot of heartache too a lot of people that church like literally looms over the city you can see it from far away and and people people get anxious about historic structures anyway but it would have been a real shame to to take that down for for the wrong reasons Absolutely. That's a really great story. And I have to admit that when I read, I was reading through your article again this morning, and uh, when I saw the sounds of silence, I had to tune into Simon and Garfunkel to get pumped up for this morning. So <laughs> love the name. Ross, I want to pivot really quickly to um, a different project that I had read in your article as well. So you mentioned this indoor tennis facility that is kind of on the western fringe of lower Michigan. I'm not quite sure where that is, but over there. Um, and you mentioned how it suffered this snow related damage due to an assumption that was made can you tell us a little bit more about that project and why it is imperative for us to revisit the assumptions that we've made throughout the iterative, iterative design process? Yeah, this one was interesting as well. Um, it was, like you mentioned, it's a, a indoor tennis structure and it's actually a fabric structure supported by a series of aluminum, I call them kind of ribs. So you can imagine them kind of stacked up this way and then the, the fabrics stretching across them. So. I didn't get to see it when the deflection was happening. That happened in the winter of 2014 or something like that. But the uh, I was called out there later as part of an insurance investigation to look at what permanent deflections were there and so forth. So as I'm looking at that, we did a bunch of deflection analysis and, and measurements. I actually got to go on top of the fabric structure, which was an interesting thing in and of itself. It's kind of like being on a bounce house because you're soft and squishy and it was weird but kind of neat um but so we're doing a deflection measurement and then we're comparing that to the ibc deflection criteria and and finding okay a few of these are are permanently plastically deformed we're probably gonna have to replace a few but i needed to drill down a little bit more into the actual manufacturer and look at the aluminum that they were using and i got in touch with the the technical resource whoever that person was and and they said, oh, no, you can't use those criteria. These are our criteria. And they're interesting. I'm like, oh, they're going to be really loose and not meet code. Interestingly, they were actually more stringent. Uh, they didn't allow they, hardly any deflection in their members. And I kind of pushed further. That'd be, that'd be fine, right? Better is, stiffer is okay in this situation. I said, well, why, why is that so much different than the IBC requirements? And they said, well, because it doesn't hold snow. Like, well, wait a minute, what do you mean? It doesn't hold snow. 
Well, the, we design these so that doesn't ever hold snow. There's no deflect. This deflection is so minimum. It doesn't hold snow. All the snow slides off and it's not a problem. I'm like, well, but it does hold snow. No, it doesn't. It can't. It's not designed for that. I'm like, well, you, but it does. It did. And we have this deflection because of it. Well, it, but it's not designed for that. I'm like, okay. So, so I'm like, thanks for the information and, and kind of moved on. Like now, now I understand. So this building, again, I don't want to pinpoint it exactly, but it's, uh, it's in Western Michigan within two or three miles of Lake Michigan. And I live, I live in this area as well. We get a lot of snow here and we get, we call it lake effect snow. So you get a lot more right on that fringe. If you look at the code book and what the, the loading is going to be, it's, it's higher, it's deeper. There's, there's just more of it there along the lakeshore. Now there's people that say, well, wait a minute, there's this sliding snow factor. And if it's steep enough and whatever, it'll slide off. It's not steep enough. I, I, we checked all that. It's not, it doesn't meet that criteria. It's supposed to be able to deal with snow. So ironically, the fact that they didn't account for it. Well, that's not the ironic part. That's just a concerning part. Like, whoa, why, why are we doing it that way? But then the irony is because it held snow, it caused it to deflect more. So you, so you imagine you have, you know, this, the straight line segment, it's not supposed to deflect some snow miraculously collects on it and causes it to deflect more. Well, now the belly is getting bigger and it can put more snow in and more snow in and more snow in. So it's getting worse and worse and worse. So fortunately it wasn't a complete failure. Uh, they, they did have plastic deformations. So we needed to replace a few of those, but if we zoom out the bigger, the bigger piece there, the, the manufacturer was, the designer, the manufacturer, the installer, the repair contractor, they were all the same entity. And that doesn't mean they can't do it and do it well, but those design assumptions of it, we just make structures that don't hold snow, that doesn't really work, at least not everywhere. So, so maybe in Texas where, where you are or in California, maybe those, those things worked, but in a, in a snow band along the, the edge of Lake Michigan, that's, that's not a good idea. And even if you tell the structure, it's not supposed to hold snow, it's going to do what it's going to do um, when the snow, when it, when it happens. So that was a, it was a little bit of a comical conversation then. And I like to tell the story and I'm not trying to say he's a bad guy or whatever, but I'm like, you can't, we can't have assumptions like that when the slope isn't correct. And and sometimes our assumptions are thrown out the window anyway, when the structure tells us, no, I'm, I'm going to, the snow is going to accumulate and I'm going to deflect whether you say it on paper or not. So evaluating those assumptions again is, and revisiting those and making sure you're not doing a blanket assumption from multiple locations. It, it needs to be refined based on where you're putting things. I would just say really quickly from the perspective of a manufacturer and having been on the on the technical side of having to provide technical documentation to structural engineers, um, we always say that the engineer's obligation is in the footnotes. And so I imagine that there was something about that snow load and maybe a certain pitch or a certain certain uh, slope of the roof. There might have been, but there was no <laughs> engineer involved. This was a one stop <laughs> shop like I'm. I am XYZ fitness facility and I want this structure. I didn't have an engineer involved. It's I'm getting it from you and you are engineering it and you're providing it and installing it and replacing the membrane and you are everything. So yeah. I'm not, I'm not trying to say you're wrong and maybe I missed something in a footnote, but there wasn't an engineer involved other than whoever's on staff at that manufacturing company. That's the reason those footnotes got missed. <laughs> if they are there. <laughs> Yeah, assumptions like, oh, yeah, it's it's a it's a dome like structure. The snow will fall off, or they maybe found some exception, and yeah, they didn't check the slopes, and just because of that, you amplify that with the probably the flexible membrane that you were talking about, probably made it a lot worse or amplified it. What's really interesting, Matt, not to to cut you off there, is I I made this presentation um, a couple of years ago at the NCSEA summit, and the like i didn't know who this guy was but like the code guy for the sliding snow piece was there <laughs> and so um i give my presentation and and then i then i ask if there's any questions at the end and this guy 
raises his hand and everyone starts snickering. I'm like, what, what is going on? <laughs> but he asked so great. He asked, cause I didn't have the exact slope in the presentation. He, and he wasn't attacking me. He's like, I need to know that slope because if it was X steep and it still held, we might need to change the code provisions. So we talked offline uh, through a series of emails and I, I revisited again, make sure I was correct on that. I'm like, no, this is the number. This is the slope we measured in the field. It's still, the provisions are still correct in the code, but it was a little bit like, whoa, I got the code guy mad at me and no, he's like, I want to make sure we have it right. So it was interesting. Um, it was an interesting feeling at the end of that presentation that day. Yeah, that's great. I, I And that's the, the best place to get it when you're actually I was like, okay, this is what we have in the code, but hey, this is a right. real life case study now. Right. <laughs> Really interesting. Could you go? Could you go into the next project about the the plastic molding and the elect? It was like the electrostatic planting company that they were expanding, and there was a failure involved. Uh, could you go into that project? Yeah. So the it doesn't matter what the building was. You said it just right. But it's so this company is really successful, and they're building a whole new place to do more more of whatever they're doing. Right. So that that part's not super critical. So they're in a they're in a fast paced construction environment because as soon as the sooner they get it done and open, they can make more money. Right. That's that's what it comes down to. Not saying they were rushing, but it certainly wasn't a slow project. So I get the call. Uh, we've had a collapse and I, and I get out there and, and two large bays. And these are big, large open span bays of Joyce girder with uh, Joyce and girders construction with steel columns. So I see two two bays are on the ground. About half of it's already roofed. These two in progress bays are on the ground and kind of a pile of mangled steel and so forth. Nobody got hurt. So, so that was good. So interestingly, usually when I get to an investigation site, there's a lot of finger pointing going on. Well, so-and-so did this or so-and-so did that, or we didn't do this or we, the steel erector came right up to me and said, it was my fault. And here's, here's why. And I was like, Whoa, that's honorable, admirable. And, um, you know, okay, what do you think happened or what happened? And he said, you know, we were, we were assembling this. And when you, when you do steel erection and kind of the fast track, they'll actually put the joist girders on the ground, set all the joists on the ground on top of those joist girders, and then they'll bring that whole frame up. Um, so before they set that frame, you got to have the end columns to receive those joist girders. And then there's a tie joist that kind of completes the square. If you think of that game you play with your friends, where you write a square on the paper and then you get the square. Well, you got to complete that square from a structural perspective to keep that strength. So they've put the columns in the ground. They have the joist girders ready, the joists all situated and ready. Um, and before they were going to lift that, they got to put in that joist, uh, that tie joist. The tie joist wasn't there. So it's getting later in the day and the tie joist isn't there. And they're like, well, it's going to come. It's going to come. Well, so that's where we pause first. The tie joist is on a truck that has a flat tire that's like a hundred miles away. So a stupid thing like a flat tire is, is causing a delay in this, in this project. So the tie joist finally arrives after the flat tire disaster and they're about to get it in place and kind of finish that square so that it's stable and a rainstorm starts. It's late in the day. It's four or five o'clock. We all know how things get at four or five o'clock, whether you're sitting in an office or you're on a construction site, it might've even been a Friday. I don't remember. They, they decide for whatever reason, we'll just get to it tomorrow. So they don't install that tie joist. Well, the rainstorm turns into a pretty significant windstorm and we know it, it goes to, it goes down and it collapses. So now we're looking at the aftermath. I get the story from, from the steel erector, but then I look at the base plates and I see the, there are double holes on all the base plate bolts where there should only be one. There's kind of two intersecting each other. It looks like they miss, miss shot the hole when they drilled it. And then I see cupped, coned um, washers coming through these holes. So not only are the holes wrong or too big, but the washers are pulling right through. I'm like, well, that's, that's interesting and concerning. And I go over to another column base plate that doesn't have a column on it yet. And all of the round washers that look like the cupped ones are thrown off to the side in the dirt. And there's these brand new, shiny, thick, square steel plate washers. And I'm like, they know something went wrong here. They're already preparing for the next one. So that's, I start scratching my head a little bit more. 
then as I'm up in a lift and looking, looking at things, I start seeing that the joist seats on many of the joists, uh, you know, you'll have the, the angle on top and then that short little angle on the bottom that sits, gives it a nice place to sit. Those are, those are missing in a, on a bunch of joists. Not that they didn't put them in, but you can see this clean bare weld where it just ripped off. So I'm like, man, these, these welds aren't sufficient. Those aren't right. These bolts aren't right. These bolt holes aren't right. And then it, and then you go back to the flat tire and the rain and the erection sequence. It's like everything went wrong on this project. It's an, it's an absolute nightmare for a structural engineer. So we've got the wrong washers provided, the wrong holes drilled, welding didn't go right in the shop. And then the erection sequence got messed up because of the flat tire. And then we didn't complete it because of the rain. All of these things happened and all of them are outside of the control of that structural engineer. Like they, they got shop drawings with the right, with the right washers on them. They got shop drawings with the right holes on them. They, when they approved, yeah, this is the right stuff. They didn't know that the erector was going to put it in place without the tie joist. There's probably an erection sequence drawing that shows them, Hey, you need that one in there before you do this. So all the things that even a picky structural engineer would, would say, Oh, we need this. We need this. We need this. Unless he's, he or she's sitting there watching it and approving every step, which isn't reasonable or, or normal. They wouldn't have known of these things. And this, this happened as those things fell through the cracks. So this was, I was driving back from this one, having kind of learned all these pieces all while I was there. And it came to me like, uh, this is a series of unfortunate events. Uh, that was a show my kids were watching at the time, like that Lemony Snicket show. So I stole, stole the title from that, but that's exactly what it was. Like one little thing led to another, led to another, led to another. And it exposed all these minor problems, but they all combined into a really major problem, all of which were outside of the control and purview of the engineer. Yeah, and I, I know it's like you were saying, in the very beginning, we were going through the construction process or the different processes that the design process goes through. Yeah, like you were saying, there is a lot of things that are in control, like the design loads, assumptions, but then when you get into this case, it's, hey, probably the structural engineer for that one, probably did everything right, got through everything. But just what you were saying in the construction field, uh, things just went wrong. Things probably weren't fabricated correctly, but they looked right on the drawings. And then, yeah, just the, the perfect perfect storm of yes. events. Ross, I wanted to, I had a question about, a, I just wanted to transition into some of the career paths because your career seems really interesting, right? It's you've gotten into structural forensics or investigations. Is that something, what was your career path like? Just because that's a good like, question. Is that, is that something that you train for? Like, is that a specialty that like, Hey, I'm going to be a building collapse engineer and go to sites. And cause it kind of feels like you're, I feel like they could make a TV show about these, like, like, um, Oh, you totally could investigations but and stuff. All, so it's all really of interesting. Us, <laughs> all of us engineers would nerd out over this, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was cool. Absolutely. Um, so it's interesting that you asked that, Matt is, so when I was in school, I, I was, first of all, I went to, I, I applied to architecture school and got accepted. And before I even finished high school, I'm like, I think I want to be more on the engineering side. So I always had that connection. And so I had never went to architecture school. I was in engineering all the way. Um, once I got there. So I went, I was at the university of Michigan. I, I went through their civil program with a focus on structural. And I thought all along, I went to an ASC presentation on the Patronus Towers. I don't know if you remember those. So, so yeah. In Kuala Lumpur, at one point, they were the tallest buildings in the world. And Thornton Thomas said he built those. And I'm like, I'm going to be, I'm going to build the next one of those. That's what I'm going to do. And I thought I'm going pure structural design. And I went to a career fair at Michigan and met, uh, a, a mentor of mine who was eventually my boss, uh, his name is Mark Krieger. He worked for West Janney where I work. Um, and all like everyone else's background is, you know, Hey, work here, interns, welcome, whatever. He's got all these pictures of collapsed buildings and the TWA flight, the fuselage and all this, all this really cool stuff. And I didn't know that existed. So Matt, I no, I didn't, 
I didn't go to school thinking I'm going to be this investigative <laughs> engineer. Like I didn't know this existed, but that, that interview, that booth at the, at the career fair changed my life. Cause I'm like, this is what I want to do. And I interned with him that summer. And then I worked for WJE and in, in Chicago for a few years, I moved back to West Michigan, which, um, brought me to a different consulting firm for a while, but I eventually came back to WJE. It's, um, it's a really cool piece of the industry. And, and I like talking about it. I, I love my job. I like that. I'm not sitting around doing calcs all day. And like I said, at the beginning, I like helping people and solving problems, but there, there is a path there then. And there are several good firms. Obviously I'm, I like my company WJE, but there there's a need for this in the industry. There's a need for understanding why things are going wrong. And it's often, you know, some of our clients are other engineers, like we don't know what we're doing, or we don't know what's happening here. And they, they, they turn to us for help. So it's great engineering. It's great use of people skills. Uh, you got to be able to think on your feet. You know, it's not like you're just mulling over a, a calc set. I'm literally standing in a collapse zone. Like we need to shore that we need to take this down. We need to get these people out of here. So it can be intense, but it makes for a really rewarding job. And I'm very thankful I met Mark that day at that career fair because maybe I'd be doing design somewhere and love it, but I, I'm pretty sure I was, I was well suited to do this job. And there's a path there. I mean, I feel lucky, not every, we don't need thousands and thousands of those types of people, but we need good engineers to do that type of work. So there's, there's definitely a path, look up WGE, look up other firms like that. There, there's a place to do this in the United States and across the, uh, across the world. So Ross, I actually took a forensic engineering course when I was in school. Um, I was allowed to take graduate courses when I was still an undergrad. So I actually have a little bit of a background in some of the work that you do. And it was something that I actually considered pursuing as well. And I know for a lot of firms right now, they actually require a graduate degree in, in either structural or forensic engineering very specifically. Um, is that something that that you went back to pursue? Is that something that a lot of the people you work with pursue? I know I see I see job uh, postings and and uh, recruiters hotly looking for uh, a lot of different people to hire into the forensic engineering uh, niche, I guess, kind of. So I, I know that there, just like you said, there is definitely a need for people who want to do this kind of work. I so I if I'm answering it correctly, I did not take a class like that. It didn't exist in my curriculum when I was there. I don't know if it does now, but I would highly suggest that people do take that just to understand it. Um, it'll make you a better engineer because it'll make you think through things like what if it failed like this? Because um, a lot of, you know, traditional designers might not, when you don't see it every day, you, you're not as skeptical of things like, huh, that I don't think that's going to work or here, here's the fatigue problem. I see with that. You just think of it as this weld is going to be perfect. This piece of steel is going to be perfect. Nothing's going to go wrong. So it'll at least give you a frame of reference. And obviously if you are interested in a career like mine, then yeah, take that class and, and see, see if you do like it. And that will probably give you a leg up on, on the interview process. But I, I love to hear that it was required for you that I think that's a good, that's a good add to any engineering curriculum. It definitely wasn't required. It was, uh, okay. I, I requested to take it specifically because it was a grad course, but it was worth it. It was absolutely fantastic. It was fascinating. And I, I got to learn from one of the professors who really kind of blazed the trail in many ways. So it was definitely fascinating. Um, so I appreciate the insight. I, I also would just let uh, any of our listeners know that if that is something you're interested in, interested in that ASCE actually hosts a specific conference for forensic engineering in the US, I believe every year. I think it's just a really short one or two day conference. And obviously right now it's virtual, but there are plenty of learning opportunities out there, even if you're not in school anymore, um, to, to get kind of a feel for what this industry looks like. I think the forensic conference is actually about every three years. Okay. Uh, I could be wrong on that. I've, I've okay. spoken at it and been to it many times, but it's been a while. And it's, I know the rhythm was starting to hit spring break and I have kids in school. So it's like, eh, I can't go, we're going wherever, you know, right. but it is, it is a very good one. There are many conferences that touch on forensics. Um, the Structures Congress will, will touch on that as will the NCSEA that I mentioned before, but that you're right, that forensics com, Congress or conference 
mm-hmm. is is very specific to that. So if you can get to it as a student or as a young professional or a seasoned professional, uh, that is a great place to go. Absolutely. I think now that you mention it, maybe we have a Texas one that's a day and it's in December and it's okay. and it is, I think, annual, but you know, just another reason to come down to beautiful Texas. <laughs> All right, wonderful. I have one final question for you and then we'll wrap it up. So you've given us so many great examples and you've kind of kind of walked us through these case studies of your personal work, which is really fantastic. Is there some advice that you can provide to our audience that they can start to implement in their design practice now um, that helps them ensure a better design execution? How, how can they be more cognizant of these different assumptions that they're making that maybe are being made for them? What, what, what actionable advice can you provide? So I guess, I guess the first piece of advice is get it out of your head that you're, that you've created a perfect design, right? That's probably not real. Even if you've got it perfect on paper and your calcs are flawless and it's been reviewed and so forth, that doesn't mean you're not susceptible to these things falling through the cracks as we discussed. So to help make sure that doesn't happen or to, and you won't guarantee anything, but to, to be better and have the project be executed better First, uh, remain engaged in the project throughout. So, so ask those questions, be diligent with your shop drawings, find place in the budget ahead of time to go to the site and make sure things are going the way you expect, because you will see things as the engineer very quickly that someone else might not. And it's not that they're being deliberately doing something wrong, but you know the value of the size of that bolt or that washer or making sure the steel is the right grade, that kind of stuff. So remain engaged throughout. And as we discussed, ask questions, ask a lot of questions, even when, oh, you're just the engineer, just get out of here. Keep asking the questions. Remain respectfully skeptical of things. Again, you're not trying to attack people and I'm not attacking the contractors. They usually do a very good job and they help fix it. And we're all part of a team, but it's okay to ask those questions and, and challenge them. And then as we talked first, challenge assumptions, um, both both the assumptions you're making, the assumptions that are kind of handed down to you and any of that provided information, make sure it makes sense. You know, if you're getting a soil report with a water table here and you know the area and you're like, that's totally different than what I expected. Ask, ask that question, just, just ask, ask the questions, remain engaged, be skeptical, challenge things. And, and as an industry, I think we need to encourage our budgets to be a little higher, the project budget to be a little higher so that we can stay engaged, so that we can get out in the field. And and maybe people call it picky and they're like, oh, you're, you're being a pain. But the value of catching and correcting a problem before it happens, I mean, the return on investment on that is incredible, just, just from a cost standpoint. But from a PR standpoint, like you don't wanna collapse on your construction site, even if nobody gets hurt, which thankfully no one did on, on any of these that's a terrible thing, right? So we, we want to stay ahead of that. We want to protect people first and foremost, but we want to reduce overall costs for the project. And by adding a little bit more for the structural engineer to be engaged a little bit more, you're going to reduce those problems potentially and, and help, you know, reduce risks of failure of property damage. And then just the general occurrence of, of any of those unfortunate events that we talked about. Thanks so much for, for that, Ross, and, uh, you know, go, for being on the podcast and going through these, uh, you know, it was a great article and really interesting case studies. And I think that's one of the best ways. I appreciate how you kind of went about that, doing these case studies to, to get your lessons learned. And uh, it's something I, yeah, I really appreciate it. And uh, I've learned a lot just because these are always fascinating, these these kind of like war stories that you go through. And and uh, just thanks thanks again for coming on and sharing it with us. Thanks so much. I, I enjoy these. Um, the fun thing about them is, you know, even if there's maybe I made a technical mistake here or there, the, I lived these. I lived these projects. And like you said, they're kind of war stories. And it's it's more about learn from the things that I've seen. And sometimes it's learned from my mistakes. But I think we get better as engineers and as, you know, just professionals in the industry when we hear, whoa, that why did that happen? Or I remember that guy that talked about this? Like, you won't forget maybe one of these and it might help you down the road. So for me, I, I like sharing it. It's fun to do. And they're, they're interesting things. And like I said, we all kind of nerd out about the same engineering stuff. And um, usually people are pretty responsive to it. So 
thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. And I encourage people, if you have stories or case studies to share, don't be shy to find a way to do that, whether it's a presentation or a paper, or even uh, maybe you're on this podcast and get to share some of the cool things that you get to do. We hope you enjoyed the episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 47, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.